So in this video, we're talking about one of the key turning points in the story of the Roman Republic, the earth-shifting tributes of the populist firebrands, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus. The most overlooked aspect of the Gracchus brothers crisis is that it is not a beginning, but a culmination. The tribunate of Tiberius Gracchus and his subsequent shocking assassination is often cited as the beginning of what's sometimes called, thanks to a famous historian named Syme, the Roman Revolution, which is to say the century of civil wars and constitutional breakdown that leads to the rise of Caesar, the collapse of the Republic, and the dawn of the emperors. But the Gracchan crisis does not arise suddenly and out of nothing. In fact, it's important to see the Gracchan crisis as the climax of tensions and fractures that had been building up within Rome since the defeat of Hannibal. First, the growing struggle of the amassing of public land, crowding out farmers with small land holdings, many of whom ended up as landless poor in Rome or seeking a new life elsewhere in the empire. Second, the closely related problem of recruiting sufficient numbers of Roman citizens meeting the military service property requirement for Rome's many wars and armies, a problem that only got worse with each passing year. Third, a deepening schism within the nobility between those who sought strength in the simpler, smaller Rome of the past and those who saw slavish adherence to tradition as the surest way to ensure leaders who were both weak and oppressive, who held the consulship because their families were entitled to and loyal to the old ways, rather than because of ability or public trust, making the Roman people both vulnerable to its enemies just when it should be strongest and crushed under the privilege of an encrusted aristocracy just when the teeming, vibrant city of Rome has left its days of unimportance and obscurity long behind it. The governing propertied families of Rome are thus becoming progressively more polarized around two fundamentally incompatible visions of Rome. One faction that seeks the permanence of tradition and sees Rome as remaining as it has always been, small, self-contained, full of men of virtue, and with the faith and trust of the people being placed in the systems and institutions and great families of the Republic, especially as symbolized by the Senate. And another faction of the nobility that sees adherence to tradition as dangerous and sees an urgent need for the people to place their trust not in the outmoded systems of a republic designed for different and simpler times, or in the desiccated great families who take turns holding office regardless of ability, or in a senate that is increasingly seeking to enforce the preservation of tradition and its own importance thereby at the expense of the people. Rather, the people's trust should logically be vested in men who have proven their abilities and shown themselves to be worthy of leadership and command. The faction that espouses conservative traditional pro-Senate values is normally called the optimates, or the best men. The faction of the elite that favors changing Rome's ways and building leadership around men of proven ability rather than families and institutions with the support of the people behind them is referred to as the populares, or the populists. Some points to note here. First, as we'll see in the next several videos, this was not a divide between nobles and masses. This was a factionalization of the ruling families, a division at the top of Rome's society over the fundamental question of Rome's future. Second, the populist movement was the one that was ultimately successful. It was represented prominently by famous heroes like the Gracchus brothers, Gaius Marius, Gaius Julius Caesar, and ultimately the last combatant of the civil wars left standing at the end, Octavian, a.k.a. the Princeps Augustus. In other words, this is the faction with all the most popular heroes and the one that won the conflict in the end after a hundred years of blood and vitriol. It's said that the victors write the histories, and though that's not always as true as it seems, it's very much the case here. The conservative optimates, especially its few famous figures like Metellus Numidicus, Sulla, and Cato the Younger, come off in Roman histories written later as defenders of repression and elitism, and blind to Rome's need to abandon tradition to survive. It's certainly true that the acquisition of empire was forcing Rome to transform, and that the optimates' resistance to needed change would have brought about unforeseen dangers. 
But the Populares were advocating the elevation of popular men above the other nobles, an idea that stood against everything Rome had believed in for hundreds of years, and one that filled good Roman men with honest horror. The deepening chasm between optimates and populares reflected incompatible means of charting Rome's way forward in a changing world, and the Romans' inability to resolve this dissonance led to generations of brutal civil wars, dictatorship, and revolution. The turmoil over Tiberius Gracchus is not the beginning of this crisis, but the moment when the building tensions of a Rome uncertain how to reconcile its austere past with its imperial present spills over into violence and bloodshed. This is something that has been building for decades and finds both release and escalation in the death of a populist radical. Tiberius Gracchus represented the cream of the Roman elite in many ways. His father was a consul from one of the great plebeian families. His grandfather was Scipio Africanus, hero of the Second Punic War, and his brother-in-law was Scipio Aemilianus, destroyer of Carthage in the Third Punic War. Not least of all, his mother was Cornelia, the most famous and admired Roman matron since the dawn of the Republic. Outspoken, virtuous, a fierce defender of her family, and an advocate of the people, Cornelia was an icon who had young women asking themselves what Cornelia, the mother of the Gracchi, would do for generations to come. Tiberius Gracchus, still a young man in his twenties, was elected tribune of the plebs on a platform of reform and defiance of senatorial privilege, especially where the Senate's entrenched self-empowerment was at the expense of the liberty of the ordinary Roman citizen. Tiberius placed himself before the Romans as a potential leader not because of his name or blood or his father's rank, but because of his ability and beliefs and his intent to empower the Roman masses and blunt the power of the elite. Conservatives blanched at Tiberius's rhetoric, reviling it as pure demagoguery, but Tiberius struck a chord and was elected with a mandate for change. The centerpiece of his platform was a bill that would break up the vast estates of public land that had been amassed by the families of the elite over the preceding century and redistribute that land to poor Roman families. This would have two benefits for Rome. Not only would it shift power away from the selfish super-rich and empower ordinary Romans, it would also address the worsening recruitment crisis by providing large numbers of new land-holding citizens with sons able to serve in Rome's armies. The wealthy naturally opposed the breakup of their estates, but legally they couldn't stop Tiberius's legislation for two reasons. First, what was at issue was the agur publicus, or public land, land conquered by Rome in Italy and legally owned by the Roman people. Individual families were allowed the right to use this land, but not own it. And the law said that you were only allowed usage rights to 500 ugra, which is about 300 acres. Many of the merged and swelling estates of the wealthy on public land were well in excess of that limit. What Tiberius was now proposing was a commission to systematically enforce the existing 500 Ugro law over every square inch of Italy, assigning all the land thus taken away from the wealthy to poor families who would become a new generation of Roman freeholders and the salvation of Rome's legions. The great landholders were, in fact, in violation of the law, and they could not assert rights of ownership because they did not own it. It was public land owned by the people. Two further actions by Tiberius Gracchus escalated the horror of the conservative elite. He defied tradition, but not the law, by deliberately neglecting to present his land reform bill to the Senate before offering it to the Assembly, a violation of custom and an obvious snub, but not against the law. The Roman system was based as much on precedent as it was on law, and a crusading reformer who cast aside precedent with the loud approval of the people seemed a worse danger to Rome than Hannibal and an array of rampaging Gauls all put together. But Gracchus took things one step too far, as even he seemed to realize. When the conservatives attempted to use one of the other tribunes to veto Tiberius's laws, Tiberius overruled that veto and encouraged the use of violence in the forum to ensure that his side was successful. 
Here we have not just the defiance of tradition, but the abuse of power for a larger purpose, an act that even some of his supporters disavowed. Something had to be done. The problem was he could not be stopped politically. The attempt at using one of the other tribunes to veto Tiberius had resulted in greater unrest and division within Rome that the conservatives could not control any more than Tiberius could people even bringing clubs to the forum to make sure they got their way. All of his legislation was duly passed by the Roman Assembly, and apart from his overruling of his colleague's veto, everything Tiberius Gracchus did was sanctioned by Roman law. The bottom line is he was too popular to oppose, and the Constitution offered no legal recourse. The desperate and enraged conservatives were thus driven to extra-legal methods to stop Tiberius before he upended the Republic and everything about Rome with it. In the mounting tensions, Tiberius Gracchus was labeled an insurrectionist by his enemies who sought to make himself king, and conservatives demanded the consuls take action against this rebel. The consuls refused, and finally, the Pontifex Maximus, an arch-conservative ex-consul named Publius Cornelius Scipio Nasica, picked up a club and called on his fellow senators to join him in defending the laws of Rome. Scipio Nasica, with a mob of infuriated senators, hunted down Tiberius Gracchus and beat him and 300 supporters to death, presumably convinced that in so doing, they were saving Rome from insurrection and disaster. His body was thrown in the Tiber to deny him sacred burial rites, one of the most disturbing ways of dishonoring a Roman citizen, and the kind of fate previously visited only on outright traitors. Tiberius' friends fought to further his reforms. The Agrarian Commission was created, and the work of breaking up the lands began, though conservatives slowed it by any means possible. Ten years after Tiberius' death, his younger brother Gaius became tribune of the plebs on an even more reformist platform that disempowered the Senate by giving its key privileges to the Order of Knights instead, re-empowering the Land Commission, reforming military service terms and equipment supply, and most radically, seeking to extend Roman citizenship to Italian allied peoples, one of the most divisive issues of the next 30 years. This time, the conservative element of the Senate was more confident when Gaius was re-elected to the Tribunate in blatant defiance of all Roman tradition, but again, not against the law. The Senate responded by declaring Gaius Gracchus a public enemy and passing what was later named the Senate's ultimate decree, calling on the consuls to save the Republic by any means necessary. Rome descended into partisan violence and then into chaos and with many of his supporters turned against him by offers of amnesty, the alternative was being tried for treason, and other incentives, Gaius bitterly fled the violence and committed suicide in a sacred grove accompanied only by his slave. Gaius' head was cut off, and as with his brother, his body and those of his supporters were thrown in the Tiber. Though conservatives attempted to demonize the Gracchus brothers for attempting to bring disorder down on Rome and to selfishly and ambitiously draw power to themselves, everyone knew that it was the noble, virtuous optimates who had recourse to illegal violence to get their way. From the death of Tiberius Gracchus and the dishonoring of his body afterwards, the Roman political system was increasingly irrelevant to the intractable conflict between the opposing factions of Rome's elite. And we'll be watching this play out over the next few weeks. For now, that's that.